Well, we might get started. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Luke Thomas. I'm the science lead for the AIMS at UWA Alliance. Um, this was set up a couple years ago. These annual events really is a platform uh, for our students and our early career researchers to showcase the, the work that they're doing um, that's supported by the Alliance. So today you'll hear from a diverse range of talks um, about you know, everything from molecules to ecosystems, a few housekeeping things. So toilets are just out that door if you need them. If you hear evacuate, um, we'll evacuate and we'll go down the stairs and we congregate in the oval um, in the center of UWA campus. And uh, obviously before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. Uh, we are on uh, Nungar Buja or Wajak Buja. Um, so I acknowledge the, the elders, pay respects, past, present and emerging. So to kick this off, I'd like it to hand it over to Karen. She's going to talk about the Alliance a little bit, and then we'll dive into the talks. Thank you. Thank you, Luke, and thank you everyone for coming today. Welcome to the second official AIMS at UWA uh, Research Symposium. Um, it's exciting to have all the students together and um, the opportunity to hear all their talks. Um, now, the AIMS at UWA Alliance, as you may all well know, was actually officially launched in November of 2020. Um, and with a commitment to offering PhD scholarships and joint postdoctoral research fellowships that are co-supervised by both, both institutions, so by the university and by AIMS, and that target applied research in tropical marine environments. So the aim of the partnership is to provide a focal point for developing the world's best marine science leaders, that's you guys, and to provide a platform to expand our joint research and to provide new opportunities, particularly for research students and early career research. Um, as I suspect you guys have already worked out, there are huge benefits and opportunities in working and learning across both organisations um, because we get to integrate fundamental and applied research and leverage the infrastructure and the research strengths of both organisations. Of course, I'm incredibly proud to be part of the Alliance um, because nurturing early career research scientists like yourselves um, is a really important part of achieving AIMS' mission um, of providing the research and knowledge to support sustainable use and effective environmental management of Australia's tropical marine estate. Um, so today we are here to celebrate the AIMS at UWA partnership and particularly to learn more about the research that some of our AIMS at UWA students and early career researchers have been doing. Um, we have a fantastic group of young scientists here with us. Um, we've got a range of those who are just starting off in their PhDs, some that are really advanced about ready to submit um, and some that have actually completed. So I think that there's going to be a really exciting range of talks. Um, and as Luke um, alluded, there's going to be a range from, you know, microscopic genes, fish poo um, and plankton right through to the macroscopic corals, whale sharks and ocean currents. So I think a really exciting and diverse um, range of talks ahead of us. Um, so I'm going to wrap up there. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's, like I said, the second official symposium um, and hopefully not the last. Um, thanks also to Luke for organising this and Louise's efforts seemingly this morning and getting the uh, IT running. Um, please enjoy the talks from our very, very talented students. Um, I'm certainly looking forward to hearing their achievements. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. All right. Um, so the format today is about five minute talks. Um, we'll have a couple of minutes after for questions and then we'll break halfway through um, and we'll have a bit more of a detailed Q&A if there are more questions. Um, so first up is our aims at UWA postdoc, Kami. Um, Kami joined us many years ago um, for her PhD research on the Rolly Shoals. She did some fantastic stuff on the hydrodynamics out there. She's shifting attention now to the Exmouth Gulf and um, working with the Mindaroo Foundation. So Kami, uh, welcome to the stage. Um, hi everyone. So yeah, my name is Camille, and um, I'm the AIMS at UWA postdoc, and I'm currently working on the hydrodynamics of Bandigui Reef and the Exmouth Gulf more widely. Um, just looking at the slide, I was thinking maybe I need to update my template because that's a photo of Los swimming at the Rolly Shoals, and that's definitely not what the Gulf is like. <laughs> so maybe it's time for an update. <laughs> 
Um, so as, yeah, as Luke mentioned, um, I did my PhD as an AIMS at UWA student. Um, I was working on the remote um, atoll reefs of the Northwest Shelf, particularly Mermaid Reef, which is part of the Rolly Shoals. And um, I was really interested in linking the hydrodynamics with some uh, key ecological processes. So I basically looked at the influence of waves and tides on um, the circulation of the reef. And then once I got a better understanding of the hydrodynamics, I was able to use that to look at the and how the hydrodynamics drives some of the fine scale coral reef connectivity and also temperature variability. So in case you didn't know, um, physical processes are really important on coral reefs because they basically drive, they, they determine the exchanges between the inside of the reef and the open ocean. And so by doing so, they influence a bunch of um, ecological processes. So it's it's really interesting to have that um, those two put together to have a, a more holistic um, understanding of the of the system, I guess. And so, um, so I submitted and um, defended my PhD this year, and I'm now working as a postdoc. And so, um, I'm I'm basically I'm basically working on a coral reef restoration study case um, for uh, Bangtigi Reef. So basically, I think some of the the main motivation for the work was that um, a lot of the restoration projects, um, they, um, they're pretty opportunistic. So most of the time, you know, people restore reefs um, where some corals have just died or um, where they can access a reef freely. And we were hoping with that project to, to provide a bit more guidance on how, a bit more scientific guidance on how to restore reefs. Um, I think from an oceanographic point of view, there is a couple of like really interesting questions. Um, for example, where do we put the restoration structures? Um, because obviously, you know, we don't want to put it in a spot that's too exposed to the waves and all the structures are going to get flipped over. But we also don't want to put it in a spot where um, the residence time is going to be very long and the research is going to cook up during summer. Um, so, you know, a couple of interesting oceanographic questions. And then from um, the ecological and genetics perspective, there is also um, what's, what coral species do we want to select? What coral species do we want to restore? And that's um, what Luke, Deck, uh, Caro and James are working on. Um, so yeah, once again, we're trying to look to link the oceanography, ecology, genetics all together, which I think is really interesting. Um, and so yeah, this project is supported by the Mindoro Foundation, but also by uh, Mars, which is the chocolate company. Um, <laughs> Sorry, so they invest a lot of money into coral reef restoration, so they're providing us with um, a bunch of frames that we're going to hopefully deploy in Van de Um Just getting the slides up for your um for everyone at home. Oh right. Not 100 percent certain why they can't see those. Once got any hot tips on perhaps resharing. Yeah, maybe we should it's been shared. Sharing. Wouldn't be a true symposium without some technical issues. Yes. So, oh, there we go. I changed it. Oh, yeah. yeah. I can see now. Okay. Um, and so I think one of the first question I would like to answer is what drives the circulation at Bandigi Reef? Because the reef is basically exposed to pretty large tides, pretty large waves, and also a bunch of like, a lot of winds. Um, and so we just want to try to tease out um, which one is the main driver and how they're interacting all together to drive the circulation on the reef. So um, we went up to Exmouth in June earlier this year, and we deployed a bunch of um, oceanographic instruments across the reef. And so that's a photo of James and Luke helping me deploy the, the current sensor here. And as you can see, it's definitely not as clear as on the first photo. <laughs> um, and so once we have um, those data, oh, can we click on the animation? Um, and so once we have those data, um, I can basically use it to validate um, a hydrodynamic model that I set up for the Bandigi Reef area. Because at the moment, um, we don't have anything to validate it. So obviously I cannot use it yet, um, but it's already when we go up there and take the data back up 
back down to Perth, then I can compare what the model is saying and what the, the data is saying, and hopefully they compare and we can just use it to understand that finer scale variability <laughs> um, of the reef. Um, once we once we go back up in November this year, I also want to deploy a bunch of temperature sensors across the reef um, because once we have a better understanding of the hydrodynamics, we can um, get a better understanding of the thermodynamics, and then we can try to uh, better understand better understand things like why Bandigi Reef bleached in 2011. Um, it lost about 90% of its cover and um, yeah, really getting an understanding of the environment will potentially help us answer some of those questions um, in the future. Um, now, just taking it a step back, um, so we were focusing on Bandigi quite a bit before and um, I also, I'm also really interested in the connectivity in the Exmouth Gulf. Um, so I'm also hoping to set up a hydrodynamic model there. Um, and Ames actually collected a bunch of data there in 1994 um, that I'm going to use to validate that model because there is not that many um, um, oceanographic observations in, in the Gulf that are easily accessible. So um, yeah, it's going to be great to have that data um, to validate the model. And then just by doing a simple, you know, particle tracking exercise, once we have the current velocities, I can have a look at um, the actual connectivity between all of the different parts of the reef. And just by adding some biological traits like spawn spawning time, larvae competency and mortality, I can make all of those simulations a bit more ecologically relevant. Um, we've swam around the Gulf quite a bit already and found some different coral reef populations across there. So I'm really hoping to also get a better, better understanding if those um, populations are connected by ocean currents. Um, so yeah, so that's what I'm, it's a lot of what I'm hoping to do. Um, so hopefully next time I can actually update you on some results. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions for Camille? There'll be a Q&A session later, but Josh, go for it. Wonderful presentation, Cam. Um, based on current, um, I know there's a, a couple of current or past studies that have looked at circulation within the northern part of the Gulf, exchanging water from that Southern Ocean swell that wraps around. What's What do you think is likely going to be a potential outcome for connectivity in that northern part of the Gulf? Oh, in the northern part. Um, I'm not too sure in the northern part, to be honest, but um, but I think there will definitely be connectivity. The, the, um, the tidal range is so big and the winds are so strong that there's so much flow going in and out of the of the world that, you know, I wouldn't be surprised with there. And I think um, a lot of the models that were established before to look at the connectivity were quite um, core scale. So I think, yeah, with, with that model, I'm really hoping to go like really fast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, get hopefully a, a more accurate representation of like that connectivity. So yeah, I'll keep you updated. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Kami. Uh, next we have Ben. Ben uh, hails from South Australia. Um, his enthusiasm is contagious. <laughs> he's been with us for the last uh, couple of years now. He's going to talk to us about some uh, movement ecology of whale sharks. Alrighty, so um, it's great to see some familiar faces in the crowd, but for those who don't know me, my name is Ben D'Antonio and I have been at AIMS at UWA Initiative doing my PhD for the last year and a half now. So today I'll be talking to you about prey availability and the and whale shark movement behaviours at Western uh, Ningaloo Reef in Western Australia. So um, at Ningaloo Reef we have seasonal interactions between the dominant current and oceanographic uh, oceanographic systems within the region and those interactions are a thought to seasonally entertain local productivity pulses. Um, whale sharks seasonally migrate at Ningaloo in relation to these oceanographic pulses and prey is hypothesized to drive this aggregation. Whale sharks are often observed feeding at the surface at Ningaloo, however their subsurface behaviours remain poorly understood. So while we often see whale sharks ram surface feeding, we are unsure what they're doing when they're diving down and at the bottom. So to actually investigate this a little bit more, we need to simultaneously measure whale shark movements in three dimensions, along with their prey um, within the region. So how do we do that? Well, it took an epic team um, across two years, both in 2017 and 2018. However, today I'm going to mostly talk about the 2018 data set we collected. 
Um, and what we did is we initially tagged whale sharks using FastLock GPS tags, which gave us uh, vertical and horizontal movement patterns of these animals, which you can see in the top left-hand side um, with a tag on the toe tag flowing behind it. Um, and while we tracked these whale sharks, we also uh, simultaneously measured the prey density using a fisheries echo sounder, um, which you can see in the map on the left uh, left hand side from you guys. Um, so we observed where the whale sharks are and we recorded where their tracks were and we then measured the prey vertically and horizontally um, in relation to those whale shark positions. Um, to then ground truth what the echo sounder was detecting, we used bongo nets from the, the salander, from the AIM salander, um, to make sure that what we were seeing were actually zooplankton or, or part of what the whale shark's prey was. So, um, from these data sets, we're able to get a high resolution whale shark tracking data set. Um, now, of course, with these GPS tags, uh, the GPS position is, um, we only get GPS positions while the whale shark is at the surface. So we then had to interpolate the tracks per one second intervals to get a three dimensional picture of what the whale sharks were doing um, throughout their time and while the tags were at bay, which you can see in the top right hand side, which is the interpolated tracks. Using the hydroacoustic data, we were then able to get measurements of prey density in both vertical and horizontal dimensions. So the depth over time plot you see in the middle, that's the, uh, the vertical measurements of prey, and we can see that it is quite well scattered throughout the water column. Um, and on the bottom uh, right-hand side, you can see the horizontal measurements of prey, which you, you get, is also quite concentrated around that point close area. From this data set, we're then able to spatially and temporally match um, with match these prey data to the whale shark data sets um, and model their shark habitat use in relation to the prey data we collected. Um, what do we find? Well, if we first just look at the two-dimensional plot on the right-hand side, um, this is a two-dimensional KUD plot. And for those who aren't familiar with uh, kernel utilisation densities, essentially um, it shows the highest probability of where whale sharks are found and the areas they're using most. So this plot clearly shows that along the 50 metre depth contour of the bathymetry, the whale sharks concentrated their movement, movements or habitat use, which you can see is the yellow outline, is considered the core area. Um, this was slightly south of Point Floats. And if we now look at that in three dimensions, which I'll go into a little bit more in a second, we can see that the sharks were diving down to that reef slope um, where potentially wave energy was aggregating the prey. Now, when we look at it in three dimensions, we can see that this is a three-dimensional KUD. So the darker colours represent the core areas of whale shark use and the lighter colours represent the extent. So what we've done here is we've calculated this volumetric density that the sharks were spending time in three dimensions. And we can see that those core areas were situated along the reef slope and reef edge where those channel structures and ridge lines, where the shark was diving down, presumably trying to access concentrated prey densities within those areas. So once we realised this, we wanted to see what happens if we overlay the spatially and temporally matched prey field with that of the whale shark movement patterns. What we found was super interesting. So if we just take a moment to look at the map on the right, we can see that when we overlaid the two-dimensional space use of whale sharks in relation to the, the horizontal hydraulic acoustic measured prey density, we can find that the highest densities of prey from that NAS data set were within that core area. When we put that into a model, which is on the top left-hand side, we can see that the whale shark space use or utilisation along the reef was associated with the higher densities of prey. So essentially what this is telling us is that whale sharks were utilising areas along the reef which consisted of higher prey densities. When we put this into a vertical dimension though, the match isn't as clear. We can see that the whale sharks are diving down to across and through the mapped prey field, presumably feeding or passively feeding at the time. However, they continually return to the surface and they weren't concentrating their efforts on those highest or most dense patches of prey. Now, this is a bit of a conundrum, and there's many people who have tried to put forward hypotheses as to why the wild sharks return back to the surface, and that is something that we're still trying to figure out and still trying to work on. Um, and a next step to try and investigate that further is to put biologging tags with cameras to visually validate what their behaviours are doing at the subsurface, because um, at the moment all we've got is the dive data showing that the sharks are diving through those prey patches and coming back up, um, and it still remains unclear as why they keep returning to the surface. So um, the outcomes of this study and what we found was that the whale shark habitat use was associated with prey density in, in horizontal space. Um, however, for an, an unknown reason and many hypotheses have been put forward, we don't 
whale sharks are not necessarily targeting depths that's associated with the highest prey densities. Um, and there's a lot more work that we can be done. And like I said, using biologging tags with cameras um, to validate what they're doing in their subsurface depths is needed to, to further investigate this information. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, did you consider any diurnal patterns of the prey of the zooplankton as that could potentially be? Yeah, so um, obviously this is a five minute talk, so and I rushed through it pretty quick. Um, but at Ningaloo, the water column is extremely well mixed. So the prey, unlike what they do in offshore, so like in the open ocean and, and big ocean gyres, the prey doesn't show a divertical migration of the, of, um, throughout the day versus night. What we do know um, is that from previous studies in the literature, there is a feeding trigger at dawn and dusk. And that's presumably due to the prey coming up. But as we can see in the, the hydroacoustic hydro patterns here, the prey is pretty well scattered throughout the water column across the 12-hour period that we have data for. Um, so that is definitely a, a question that we, we need to look at moving forward. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have the data to show that. So yeah, thanks. Yes, Karen. You mentioned there's a couple of hypotheses around why they go to the surface, which I agree, it seems really crazy. Yeah. Um, can you give us a bit of more detail on what those might be? And have you got any plans to actually test any of them? I really working? hope Mark's not listening to this. <laughs> um, I've got, yeah, yeah. So uh, the hypothesis that we put forward is um, is that whale sharks, and we're very lucky here at Ames, we've got heaps of uh, incredibly talented members of the team who have written papers investing in this further. And um, I've tried to build on that some of that stuff. And um, we found that in, in 2015, Mark released a paper where he talked about the body plan of, of the shark, of whale sharks and what allowed them to get so big. And, and as it turns out, they're quite constricted in their energy budgets. So to, to capture food, they have to remain slow, steady, have a fixed low power swim speed. Um, so unlike the great whales, so blue whales and baleen whales, humpbacks, who can do manoeuvres and dynamic turns and twists and lunges, whale sharks aren't actually able to do that because they're so constrained in their movement patterns already due to their energetics. So the hypothesis that we are putting forward here is that the whale sharks are passively feeding as they dive down, so they're continuously passive rain filter feeding within the jive mouth. And if anyone's seen or swam with them, you can kind of see them, they swim around with them out there. Um, and they go back to the surface as a potential search behaviour because it's actually more efficient for them to feed on something that is suspended against the surface or trapped. And that is maybe or presumably due to the fact that they actually struggle to capture prey, especially dynamic prey such as zooplankton, that is suspended in the water column and can actually avoid the capture. Um, the other hypothesis is thermal regulation, um, but at the at Ningaloo, because the water column is so well mixed and the temperature doesn't change from the surface to around the seabed, um, that might not be as, as significant here. But again, we don't have the data to, to prove any of this. This is all just yeah, hypotheses. Yeah, cool. Yes, Jamie. Um, how will the camera tags that you said you might use, how will that, you know, inform you further? Yeah, right. Okay, so um, if I go back here, is a camera tag um, and there's another PhD student uh, called Christine, um, Christine Barry. She started a year ago. Uh, she's at, at Murdoch so and she's actually away at the moment unfortunately um, but she's analysing the data and essentially what the camera tag allows you to do, it records triaxial accelerometry so surge, heave, pitch and that's the shark moving in three dimensions, their tail beat, their body flexing um, but it also shows uh, what the shark is doing as it's moving forward and you can visually classify those three-dimensional biologging or accelerometry traits with the camera to better understand what they're doing when they're away from the surface. We can't see them. Um, yeah, does that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, next up is Laurence uh, or Lars. Lars has been with us for a while now. She's one of our senior PhD students. Um, she also did her honours with us as well. Um, she's done some really fantastic work on eDNA metabarcoding, applying it um, to species and communities and ecosystems. Um, so I'll let her tell you about that. Uh, well, Lawrence, welcome to the stage. Chris. 
Sweet. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Lawrence, and I'm just about to submit my PhD. So I thought today I would give you a very quick overview of everything that I've been doing in the past four years. Um, uh, so first of all, I just want to acknowledge we're meeting on Wajak Nuya Buja, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so environmental DNA consists of all the genetic material that um, is found in environmental samples, such as air, soil or water, uh, because as be uh, basically as species interact with their environment, they continuously expel DNA to their surroundings. Um, and we can use this DNA, sample it, extract it and analyze it to detect the taxa that lives in an environment. So eDNA technology is relevant for Northwest Australia because uh, ecological monitoring often occurs in remote locations that can be quite difficult to survey. Um, so my PhD aimed at testing the utility of eDNA metabarcoding for marine monitoring with a focus on ecological scales. So from ecosystem level applications to single species. So first of all, I um, Firstly, I applied a general 18S assay to produce an inventory of the coral reef diversity of Ningaloo Reef. And I wanted to investigate the spatial structuring of eDNA signals across adjacent reef zones. Uh, so to do that, I collected seawater samples from uh, nine uh, slope sites and then five lagoon sites across uh, more than 170 meters of coastline. So this revealed that uh, despite high connectivity between adjacent reef zones, um, metabarcoding can resolve fine scale community structure. And I identified a distinct set of taxa representing each reef zone, and as well as a pattern of isolation by distance when we looked at the slope samples, suggesting that reef communities are spatially stratified along um, in the latitudinal and cross-shore uh, pattern. So this single survey also recovered 401 taxa spanning 14 phyla, providing a baseline for Ningaloo Reef from which uh, future changes can be assessed. Next, I then applied eDNA metabarcoding to recover the diversity of coral communities at the Rowley Shoals. And I utilized coral specific assays and compared eDNA results to conventional survey um, methods, such as, as visual surveys. And then I also curated the reference sequence database um, using museum voucher, voucher specimens for 94 coral species. Uh, Metabarcoding recovered 40 different coral species, and species level taxonomic assignments increased more than twofold when we used our site database. And then despite considerable overlap in the diversity we recorded in terms of genus level uh, between the survey methods, both um, techniques identified a unique set of taxa, which shows the importance of multidisciplinary monitoring. And next, I applied eDNA to generate population level genetic information on the Ningaloo whale shark aggregation, and I examined the potential of um, accurate individual level haplotyping from seawater eDNA. So I was able to accurately uh, haplotype individual whale sharks uh, as shown by a 100% match rate between the tissue and the seawater templates for each of the 28 individuals that we sampled. And I also found a clear dominant signal, oops, that figure is all messed up, um, a clear dominant signal in um, corresponding to the correct haplotype sequence uh, in all of the seawater samples we collected. So this demonstrated the utility of eDNA haplotyping in supplying critical uh, demographic data on marine megafauna. And then finally, I applied eDNA metabarcoding to understand the spatial distribution of um, silver lip pearl oysters along 80 Mile Beach. And I compared the results of eDNA to traditional tow video survey data. So oysters were detected at four of the 12 locations we sampled with eDNA, and all of our detections occurred in inshore sites less than 40 meters deep. And then the tow video surveys observes um, oysters in depth ranging from 28 meters to 76 meters, although about 92% of observation also occurred in inshore sites less than 40 meters deep. So despite observing the species in the offshore areas, the species density was quite low, as you can see in the orange dots, which is only one oyster 
observed uh, per transect. So generally, uh, overall eDNA results match the top video data and confirm the spatial extent of the stock to be occurring mainly in the inshore zones. So collectively, my research highlights um, the utility of marine metabarcoding with ED, uh, marine monitoring with eDNA metabarcoding, and I hope I've showed that um, it can answer ecological questions at the scale of whole ecosystems, reef communities, populations, as well as organisms. Any questions for a while? Awesome. Uh, fantastic work, uh, really nice presentation. I'm curious about the community level analysis. Mm -hmm. um, this overlap that you find is it in terms of presence, absence of coral taxa? Yep. And does it relate, like missing the taxa that you couldn't find, is, does it correlate to abundance or? Um, yeah, what, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, that's a good question. So that's about the coral specific uh, paper, yeah. yeah. Um, so that was all uh, presence and absence. So we just looked at the basically the species list or the genus list and compared across methods. In terms of getting estimates of abundance or biomass is quite tricky with eDNA, especially when you use assays, because not all your um, species will amplify as well as the other. So then you end up, for example, with 10 times as much species A in your reads which doesn't necessarily mean it's 10 times it's more abundant. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the like biggest avenues of the field is to try and figure out how we can get um, quantitative estimates. So for that specific study, we just looked at presence and absence. Yeah. I've got a quick one. Mm -hmm. Where is the, in your opinion, where's the field of eDNA? hitting what's sort of what's hot what's what's next yeah good question um i think using edna to move as i said from species inventories and presence and absence and kind of general monitoring towards applications like for population genetics like i showed a little bit with the whale shark um paper and potentially environmental rna which would give you um maybe an idea of gene expression um from signatures in the in the marine environment without necessarily um, uh, using tissue samples, basically. Yeah. Great, thanks. Next up, we have uh, Shannon. So Shannon joined us several years ago now for her master's project, um, and then transitioned to a PhD. She's taken on a really ambitious uh, genomics project using sort of cutting edge techniques. Um, so I'll let her talk about some of the field work that she's done over the last couple of years. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I begin today by acknowledging we're gathered on Wajak Nunga Buja, and I want to acknowledge the Jini Gadira people of Ningaloo, where I conduct my research. I recognize traditional owners as the first scientists and researchers of the land and sea, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. My name is Shannon, and I am a PhD, and I use molecular techniques to understand the standing uh, thermal tolerance of corals at Ningaloo Reef. Today, I'm really excited to share with you how we spawned some corals at Exmouth at the Mindaroo Exmouth Research Laboratory, which I'll refer to as MEL from now on. <laughs> Most corals reproduce through broadcast spawning. So this annual event occurs following a full moon where individuals along a reef will re mass release their gametes into the water column where they're fertilized by neighbors. They develop into larvae and float around for a while before heading back to the reef to settle and metamorphosize into an adult coral form. For this chapter of my PhD, we used larvae as a representative gene pool of Ningaloo corals and ran a heat stress uh, survival experiment where we compared the DNA to, of the survivors of the heat stress to the general population to see if we can find regions of the genes uh, genome that associate with survival to heat. Um, but to do this experiment, we needed a healthy population of larvae in a controlled environment that we could heat stress. 
Um, so I'm going to walk you through how we got that population. So on the day of the full moon, we steamed out to Tantabidi Lagoon, where we'd mapped out gravity colonies for the experiment. Once underwater, we found the colonies and with a hammer and chisel, took a quarter of it and passed it up to the snorkeler above, who then swam it back to the boat. On the boat, we stored the corals in Nelly bins, supplied with fresh seawater and aeration, and covered them with shade cloth to keep them cool and happy. When we were back on land, we headed back to Merle and unloaded the corals into large holding tanks flushed with fresh salt water. And then we began to wait. Each night, uh, an hour before sunset, we would head down to Merle to look for signs of setting. And on the fourth night, we finally saw what we were looking for, which is bundles of uh, eggs and sperm at the mouth of the polyp of the corals. So we separated them into their own buckets and waited for them to do their magic. So they spawned an hour after sunset. And once they were done, we gently scooped the bundles of eggs and sperm and placed them into their designated uh, white bowls per colony. And then we agitated them to split open the bundles and separate the eggs from the sperm. Once they were split, we transferred them into measuring cylinders and siphoned off the sperm concentrated water into the white cups that Smiles is doing now. And then we could um, measure the eggs to get a reproductive output for each colony and then washed those eggs to remove any excess sperm surrounding them to prevent cell fertilization. <laughs> Um, once we'd done that for every colony, we did some calculations and combined approximately 35,000 eggs and 100 ml of sperm from each colony into a 20 litre bucket so they could mix and get to know each other for five minutes. And then we moved them from that big bucket, we're about to do it in a second, um, into a larger holding tank for an hour undisturbed so they could really get fertilizing. Um, once our hour was up, we looked under the microscope to check for fertilization. We were looking for a fortune cookie shape, which you can kind of see there, um, which shows the first cleavage of the eggs. We then got to wash the eggs again, the fertilized eggs, to prevent polyspermy. And then we measured out equal amounts to fill in the grow out tanks uh, at 400 eggs per litre. Here we left them over undisturbed for the night to develop into larvae. So following spawning night, we would then run settlement tests each day to check for healthy larvae. Each night we would put 10 larvae into each of these six well plates with a piece of coralline crustose algae, which lets, um, releases chemicals that induce settlement to the larvae. So overnight they would search for their best spot to settle down and begin metamorphosizing into that first coral polyp of the future adult. Uh, each body we would count how many had settled, and once we hit 50% settled, we knew it was time we could start our heat stress experiment. Uh, stay tuned for next year to find out the result. <laughs> Everyone who helped out in this massive adventure of something else. Any questions? Great. All right, um, next we're going to shift gears a little bit. A welcome to the stage, Amy. Amy has recently joined us as a PhD student under the Reef Song Project, uh, focusing on coral uh, fish interactions. So welcome, Amy. Um, hi everyone, my name's Amy, so I'm a very fresh PhD student under the Aims at Reef um, program. So I've been here for about a month, so um, my talk's are more going to be hypothetical, coupled with some uh, degrade graphics. So yeah, <laughs> I'm going to be looking at the effects of fish-derived nutrients on coral ecology and physiology. So I'd also just like to pay my respects to the Wadjuk Noongar people, who are the traditional custodians on, um, of the land in which we meet today and pay respects to their elders, past, present, and future. Okay, so there are a lot of mutualistic benefits that occur 
during fish coral interactions. So some of the key ones that I'll go through is that corals do provide habitat for reef dwelling fishes. Um, they also provide protection. So the structures provide protection from predators for those fish. And they also provide food to the fishes, either fish that eat corals um, and also the algal growths on corals provide um, grazing food to fish. So in return, fish can also mediate algal growths on coral. Um, they have a role in reducing disease along, along reefs. Um, and they can also enhance coral physiology, which is particularly what I'm interested in. So fish actually excrete nitrogenous wastes via their gills um, in the form of ammonia. And this has um, been shown to be beneficial to coral physiology, particularly to the symbionts. So most of you probably already know, but corals live in a very tight symbiosis with um, microscopic intracellular dinoflagellate algae called zooxanthellae, um, which are referred to as symbionts. So studies that have actually tested increased ammonia availability in the water um, with corals have seen increases in symbiont densities, um, increases in photosynthetic pigments, so chlorophylls, and actually also increases in photoprotective pigments, um, which then translate into uh, higher photosynthetic productions or photosynthetic efficiencies. So most studies that have actually tested um, this effect have either just tested the actual ammonia enrichments in water with corals or the ones that have looked at fish coral interactions, um, testing fish versus no fish, um, have sort of failed to actually track nutrient flow and the uptake of this ammonia by corals. Um, and they've also haven't really looked at the different biological me mechanisms by which this can occur. So fish also increase water flow and aeration around the corals. Um, and there's also increased nutrient availability, not just by ammonia, but also through fecal matter, which is an organic source of nutrients. So first, we're going to try some preliminary experiments to test a new method by tracking these nutrients. So this will be um, used by stable isotope analysis. So firstly, we're going to enrich some fish food, um, mix that with a food source that's really high in the heavy isotope of nitrogen. Um, we're looking at an amino acid at the moment. <laughs> So once we do that, um, we'll be feeding the fish more in like specialised feeding bays to separate any interaction between the food and the coral. Um, so the fish and corals will be maintained in a tank, um, probably up in Waterman's or maybe at CSIM. Um, and during this time, we'll feed them religiously and we'll also be taking periodic tissue samples and water samples for um, concentrations of ammonia and stable isotope analysis to eventually then see when an equilibrium within the fish is reached and then exactly how much of that nitrogen derived by the fish is actually being incorporated into both the um, coral host tissues and also the symbiont tissues. So this method will then drive any future experiments that we'll do. Um, so we can look at fish coral interactions and nutrients flow through um, various scenarios using different treatments such as doing thermal stress, um, elevated sea temperatures or acclimat uh, acclimated rising sea temperatures. Uh, also looking at different biomass of fish, um, testing this theory with different species of fish and coral. Um, so I think we're predominantly going to be looking at dasylus fish or damselfish and acropora, which is quite a well-known um, mutualistic relationship there. But there's also other different species to test. And with these results, we can then combine them with infield studies and use some statistical mathematical modelling to then apply this to a more broader um, region and more on an ecological scale, uh, scale. And that's it so far. Any questions for Amy? Mm. I'll do my best. Yeah. Another main question because I'm a chemist. Um, <laughs> so ammonia can exist as both ammonia and ammonium. And temperature and pH are pretty strong in controlling that speciation change. Um, are you going to be monitoring that in your experiments and comparing that to what happens in the environment? Uh, so we're going to be monitoring temperature um, and also making sure pH is balanced and kept consistent. Um, it's not a factor that we're completely considering at the moment, but it is something that's going to be, obviously, if it's going to affect the concentrations of ammonia slash ammonium and things like that in the water, um, it'll be taken into consideration when doing those more maths and stats modelling. And I'm sure I'll be more enlightened on the subject the more talks I have with Greg. <laughs> cool.
Uh, so now's the time if there's any more questions for any of the presenters. You can ask them or we can just take a break for five minutes and then reconvene. All right, let's take a break. Thanks, everyone. Uh, five minutes or so. Come back. Thanks. Okay. Hey, nice. <laughs> All right, we're going to carry on. So we've got four more uh, speakers, and then we'll wrap up with the Q&A. Um, next up is Megan. Megan is a fellow Californian. Uh, she's been with us for a while, so she's also a senior uh, PhD student with us. And she's going to talk to you today about some spatial ecology, movement ecology of whale sharks. Thanks, Luke. <laughs> Um, I'm going to see how this thing works first. Cool. All right. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm assuming I need to stand here. Um, my name is Megan. I'm investigating whale shark movements in the Indonesian archipelago, and I am in my final few months of my PhD. Um, what I'm going to be showing you is some of my second chapter with only five minutes. I just wanted to give you a brief little dip into what I've been doing. So... So the first question is, where is Chenderwasi Bay? Uh, before I started this research, I couldn't even pronounce it, let alone identify where it was on a map. It's in northeastern Indonesia. It is a very large bay with about 400 kilometers at its widest point, and it's about 1,600 meters deep. So it's an extremely deep, large bay, and there are whale sharks there. So the whale sharks in Chenderwasi Bay exist um, kind of in this relationship with what's called a bog on fishing boat. So this is a bog on fishing boat. And basically the way it works, it's this huge drop net fishing system where these giant drop nets, about 20 by 20 meters wide, are dropped down into the water at nighttime. These lights turn on and attract these small fish that they call puri. They're just like these little aetherinids and they're about this big. Um, the whale sharks really like to eat those. They're quite nutritious. And what started happening was the whale sharks would get caught in the net when they brought them up. Now, normally that is very bad, but in this case, whale sharks, first of all, can buco pump so they can bring water in and filtrate their, um, <clears throat> their gills. But also what they can do is swim around because this is a 20 meter net. So that gave my previous supervisor from my master's, Mark Erdman, the idea to place this uh, really robust fin tag on these animals. This is me doing work actually back in 2016 in Chenderwasi Bay. So this is a um, 364A splash mount tag, and it records depth, temperature, and light levels. What's unique about these tags is up until this point, whale sharks had been um, putting a, a big tag on this time, this animal is really difficult because whale sharks are huge. You can't pull them along the side of a boat like you normally can with other things. So traditionally and typically in the past, you dart them in or you swim as fast as you possibly can and pray that you get it just on their um, on their fin here. But because they were in the net, we were able to wrap them up in kind of like a cocoon and fix this really high resolution data tag. So. Uh, the aims of this particular chapter was to describe the movement patterns of whale sharks tagged in this area and then determine if there were any differences between resident and transient sharks. And I will talk to you about that just now. So all tags were deployed on juvenile males. Uh, they record light, temperature, and depth at 10 second intervals, which uh, we were able to download 22 tags and... There we go, uh, yielding 88 to 782 days of consecutive data. This is the largest whale shark data set available basically in the world. And um, I can tell you because it has 260 million archive records, which basically just means it crashed my computer a lot. Uh, and it, it was a beast to mess with, but um, it's, it is a very incredible data set. So typically with whale sharks, like I said, they're, uh, they put tags on them that tend to end quite quickly. Um, they don't have the same lifespan as these ones do here. And so I think previously, the most anyone's gotten is just over a year of data, but obviously we have over two years of data and this is 10 seconds of data. So it's really cool. And I've been able to do some pretty cool stuff with it, but just a brief snapshot. So uh, initially, oops, that's what 
with it. But initially, my previous supervisor spent about 50 grand on these tags. Like he got donors and everything to do this and spent more on actually going out there and tagging him. And all the sharks remained within the bay. And he was like, oh no, did I just spend all of this money to watch sharks mill around the bay? I'm happy to tell you that's not what happened. And they actually observe, they actually have different behavioral patterns in the way that they move. So there's some sharks that do stay in the bay the entire time. I don't know if it's working. Is it? Should be. Okay. Let me just. There we go. Um, there are also uh, six. So it's 12, uh, 12 individuals remained within the bay the entire time. Remember, we have 22 tags. And then there are. I don't think it works while. Yeah, I'm just making sure everyone at home can see. Oh, yeah, that's fine. I'll just give it. No, it's OK. I'll just give it a second. That's fine. You should be good now. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, and six individuals went in coastal patterns. Um, but more interestingly, and my favorite tracks are the offshore pattern are, are the offshore tracks here. So this individual 173194 traveled over 22,000 kilometers in its about 700 day tag journey. Um, but these tag, the, this was only about a month's worth of time here, and this is about two months worth of time. So they, it really just went all over the place as much as it possibly could in quite an extraordinary way. Um, so with, oh, okay, there we go. It, it worked, sorry. Okay. so. Um, we have those, so we have those three different patterns. We have in, out, and offshore tags. And the red lines represent when they leave the bay and the blue lines represent when they return to the bay. Now, as you can see here, the diving that is taking place and, and sort of the patterns here sometimes go down to about a thousand meters. But what we really notice is when they go offshore, they're doing these really deep dives and they're doing them quite frequently. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes, but we can, ooh, well, that was, it finally caught up. That's great. Um, like you said, what would a presentation be without a bit of technical difficulties? <laughs> if, if I think it was, thank you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I them back now through the slides. Yeah. <sighs> but it ruins the whole aesthetic. I don't really have that much more. Um, all right, so uh, like I said, what we notice is that when they're outside the bay and specifically when they're offshore, they're doing much more diving. They're doing much more dives past that 200 meter mark. And we also notice that when they're in the bay, they are existing in these thermal temperatures. So this is 30 degrees Celsius and they're spending quite a bit of time here compared to outside and offshore, which suggests that they must be getting some really important benefit from staying in this area um, to be existing above their thermal tolerance. And because of that, we looked into the switching state space models. So looking at the area restricted searching or um, the traveling of these animals. And you can see here that the percent of time that they're spending when they're inside the bay for feeding is much more than other otherwise when they're outside they're kind of spending about equal times doing both of those things so here are the sort of central areas to where they're feeding they're obviously traveling offshore to get to these places um i because this is such a remote area there's not a ton of information on whether or not there is some sort of spawning or some sort of activity that happens every year that these animals are traveling to um, so my guess is that something like that is happening, but I haven't been able to find any actual information. And unfortunately, because it's not in blue, we don't have the access to send a bunch of fancy equipment to get prey density mapping. Um, I just have to say, I think they're eating here. Um, <laughs> and, and that's, that's that. Uh, yeah, and now what I'm looking at, so this is my third chapter, I'm looking at the physiological and environmental factors that are driving extreme dives, so dives over 700, 700 meters. And um, what's unique about these dives is they happen uh, with a lot of animals, but specifically whale sharks. And there haven't been many within data sets uh, that, that you could actually look at these because they don't happen as frequently as, you know, other, th other behaviors that they're doing. But within this data set, I actually have over 300 of these extreme dives to analyze and try to figure out what they're do why they're doing them, because we still don't know after all this time and all the research that's been done with whale sharks, we only have suggestions as to why they are doing these dives, but we don't actually know why. And I'm really curious about it. And I have 
two and a half months to figure it out. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Yeah. I have two questions. Yeah. So the first one, you almost skipped over it as if it was nothing. How do you wrap up a whale shark in a, in a net? net? <laughs> Um, well, it's, it's quite a process. Um, so we, we went to, um, they, we pay the bog on fishermen to do this. So, um, what we do is, and okay, so they started going in there sort of by happenstance and that's where my supervisor got this idea that, oh, maybe we can hop in there and tag them. Um, but then we realized we could actually coerce them into the nets and that's how we were able to remove. Oh yeah. I forgot to mention that we were able to remove and download 22 of these tags, which is a huge thing. And the way that we did that was leading them back into the nets, removing the tag and downloading it. So what they, what we do is we, they, I was inside the net while this happened. It was pretty cool. So they like hand crank this net all the way up. And then what they do is they gather it in all these different spots and kind of force the whale shark into smaller and smaller and smaller bits of it. And then we hop out and then the, the whale shark is in like a cocoon. And then we hop in with the whale shark while it's in a cocoon and basically can't move, but can still breathe and is fairly comfortable and put the tag on or take it off. Yeah, and that's the way shark's fine with that. Okay. Yeah, um, we had, so the um, someone from Georgia Aquarium who works with whale sharks came out and did blood work on it to test cortisol levels during this, and they didn't seem to care at all. I was there uh, during a field season, and I saw people literally stepping on them, and they were just like, so <laughs> I... I don't think they were too bothered by it. Um, I didn't have any, I had a lot of bruises, uh, but that was that was basically it. Yeah, what was your second question? Um, do you know anything about the individuals that traveled outside the bay? Like, do you know anything about the age, sex? I don't know what you take. So they're all juvenile males and they're all around the same size. And the, it's not, you know, it's tempting to say, okay, maybe they're traveling outside to get ready to reproduce or to reproduce, but the larger animals aren't the ones doing that. So we have the largest animal that we have tagged is a seven meter male and it wasn't the one, it stayed inside the bay the entire time. The one that went offshore was 5.5 meters. So it doesn't seem like it's related to reproduction or mating or anything like that, but that's what most people propose why they would be leaving this area. But it's also interesting because they always come back too, because that's how we get the tags, so yeah. I also have two questions. Uh, first, so you have about two years of data. Can you, do you know if they're repeating a movement patterns? Yeah. No. <laughs> so I, I, no, they're not. I actually had a, um, a slide that I took out because uh, I wanted, because it didn't really show anything. Because the short answer is no, there's no seasonality to their movements. It doesn't seem like they repeat it at the same time every year. Only that one chart irrigation that they're going to try and it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it based on what's here. It seems kind of like the sharks just decide to leave. I tried to find some sort of evidence for months as to why they might be doing that and nothing really strongly pointed to why they might be leaving with the data that I have, so. Um, the people from the Georgia Aquarium that um, tested them, yeah. did they do, do they look at other things as well? Like for example, if, um, if they're looking for prey that are perhaps more nutritious outside, for example, then perhaps you might get signatures like fatty acids in, in the animals that might indicate that they have a different sort of biochemical makeup from the ones that stay in the bay or that just go in the coastal areas? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, because the work is done in Indonesia, it's very hard to do tissue samples. Blood is a bit different, yeah. but tissue samples are quite hard to get and test. Um, blood is a little bit easier. So from, um, from that, I don't, I don't think that they did anything extra. I think they were more concerned about the welfare of the animal. Uh, but what I can say is that the food that they're feeding on in this area is extremely nutrient rich. Um, they're eating these, the, you know, like I said, those small fish and they're eating big, huge mouthfuls of them, which obviously would be a higher caloric intake than let's say swimming around trying to eat krill or any other zooplankton. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned that you only tag juvenile males. Is that because they're the only ones that ever ended up in the nets? And related to that, how representative then do you think is the data based on yeah. juvenile males yeah. and the population more broadly? Good question. Um, so we did a demography study back in 2016, which I did my master's on, and out of all of the sightings that we did, which was about 150, 
96.5% of those were males, juvenile males. So there is a very small percentage of females in this area. I think while I was there over two weeks, I saw one female the entire time. And they are not, they are not about the net at all. They just don't come around the bogons. They don't want to have anything to do with them um, for the most part. So I think we have a couple females that have been tagged in other locations, but not here. Yeah. So they've been looking for females then. Have there been any sightings in the areas where they're traveling far? I mean, it's definitely possible, but the problem is, so we get this data like later, right? And we have no idea where, and there's there's no one there. I mean, there's no one out in the middle of that ocean and there's no, there's the place that I stayed while I was here is was literally this little stretch of beach with like two families on it and that was it. So there's not, there's not a lot of opportunity to go out and observe these things as they're happening, unfortunately. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up, uh, young master Declan uh, will talk to us about some really exciting uh, coral genetics that he's working on. Uh, Declan joined us as an honor student studying uh, the microbiome of corals, and he's sort of continuing that research, focusing on the Exmouth Gulf and the uh, Ames. Mindaroo UWA Coral Resilience Project. Declan, over to you. Uh, yeah, so I am um, just beginning my PhD journey, started at the beginning of this year, um, and I'm another coral person here at Ames at UWA, and I'm primarily interested in heat tolerance of coral, so quite a relevant topic with climate change and ocean warming, um, and so I've been pretty intent on studying this for a long while, so really exciting they get to do this now. Um, unfortunately, heat tolerance isn't the easiest trait to understand. There's quite a few factors that contribute to it. So um, you have the host physiology and genetics, as well as the microbiome and symbiotes that live within the coral tissue itself. So all these play a role um, in contributing to the thermal tolerance of our host. And um, so over the next three years, um, I'll be hoping to sort of um, unravel some of these interactions and these are the sort of the overall aims of my PhD that will form my chapters. So identifying the genetic correlates of leaching resistance, so the genes and um, DNA, uh, as well as um, identifying some of the unique microbial associations. So do our heat tolerant corals have uh, microbes that are only found in, um, only found in the heat tolerant corals compared to the susceptible corals? And uh, do they play a role in heat tolerance? And then lastly, um, identifying gene expression differences between heat tolerant and susceptible corals. So um, different from DNA, uh, gene expression will look at um, what's actively being expressed in the coral during times of thermal stress. Bit of delay with the slides. I'm gonna press it too many times. <laughs> um, Yep, so I get to study up at Ningaloo Reef, which is really exciting. So I'm sure many of you have been up to Exmouth and snorkeled along Turquoise Bay and the likes. It's a really great site. Um, we're actually in the Exmouth Gulf. So over on the right hand of the screen, you can see that big sort of golfy area. Um, and we're specifically at Bundegi Reef. It's been shown sort of the conditions there are a bit different from the west side, but um, we love it. It's got its own sort of charm. Um, and yeah, we're just targeting this one specific species, Acropora tenuous, for all our genetic work. Um, yeah, so Bonnegi has its own sort of charm, but we picked it for a few other reasons as well. Um, it's gone through a lot. It's uh, seen a lot of things. So it used to be quite a pristine reef. Uh, there were glass bottom boat tours, a lot of snorkel tours. Um, and then along came quite a few cyclone events um, and some coral bleaching events. Hope my little cool graphics work, maybe not. But um, yeah, look, the, the reef's gone through a lot, especially in 2011, there was a large bleaching event, um, which saw 73% of all um, corals were either bleached dead or injured. Um, <laughs> a little tornado didn't come in, but yeah. <laughs> Um, basically, we, we're left with these large sort of rubble zones um, and it just, yeah, left a really interesting site to sort of um, study heat tolerance. So, yeah, these corals have gone through a lot of trauma in their past, so 
really cool site for also restoration with that rebel zone. Um, but yeah, back to how we figure out what uh, heat tonic coral is. If you could try and play that video, it'd be wicked. Yeah, so we collect, well, uh, yeah, no worries if it doesn't. Um, but yeah, we basically collect all our coral from Onegi Reef, so aiming for 150 corals. Um, take it back to the Binduru Research X Mouth Labs, Mel, Shen, um, and we put them into these holding tanks, fragment them up, and then transfer them to our experimental tanks. So smaller tanks where we can ma manipulate temperature and light at the different parameters. Um, but basically, we'll be cooking up all the coral and seeing what survives, and what doesn't. Um, Oh, cool. <laughs> so pretend that was playing over the last bit. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Really cool footage. Um, so yeah, they're all our individual colonies, and then we break off little bits of nubbins and put them into our um, experimental tanks. Yeah. And that's where we can manipulate all our things, do our heat source experiments. Cool. Yeah, so... Although this coral is from the same area in Bundegi, so same environment and experiencing the same thermal stress, um, because of differences, uh, individual differences, some corals will be more susceptible and some will be more tolerant than others. And then by comparing the microbiome genetics and <laughs> um, physiology of those uh, tolerant susceptible corals, we can sort of begin to figure out the mechanisms that are driving thermal tolerance at Ninglu Reef. Um, and that's sort of the overall idea of my PhD, and uh, it links into that broader program where we're identifying um, all the genetics of the corals and then um, figuring out what what candidates can be used, heat tolerant candidates can be used for restoration in Ninglu, um, as well as all those other mechanisms I talked about uh, driving thermal tolerance in that area. Ooh. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for sponsors. Um. <laughs> also, thanks to Luke, my supervisor, and Jason Kennington. Real good talk, Deck. Any questions for Declan? Molly? Um, so, sort of based on I don't know, previous previous research or mm. anything that you've looked into, are you ex have you got any expectations for like what you might find in terms of differences in gene expression between gene expression. And yeah I think gene expression is one of those things that like you're going to find differences a lot of differences um and then figuring out what's actually relevant is going to be the the hard part um certainly there's been um differences found but I think they're the changes with, you know, species and location. So I think figuring out those gene expression differences for um, quite a significant and local reefs is really important, um, and especially in the broader scheme of that program where we're trying to figure out heat tolerant candidates um, for restoration purposes or that greater um, coral resilience project. Yeah. Yep. Um, are you taking into account the handling, so the chiseling and then the gluing onto the plates? Because there's been research that showed that just that handling can alter the transcript home for several Yeah, months. so um, Shannon showed the sort of collection process. So we, um, they all sort of experience that same sort of chisel. We don't glue onto plates. We have separate sort of nubbin holders, but um, they're transported from the boats uh, in those aerated tanks and then we have a holding period in tanks overnight. So they have a 24 acclimatization sort of process in those holding tanks at Mel before then doing heat stress. But yeah, specifically looking at like the effects of breaking up the oven and then we haven't yet done any sort of specific experiments looking at the effects of that, I suppose. But um, yeah, they're all experiencing that same process and have that same period to adjust. So I don't think there'd be too much variation between individuals. So. Thanks, Declan. Next up is Brendan. Brendan is one of our few honor students talking today. Excuse me. Our only honor student talking today. Uh, Brendan joined us earlier in the year. He's doing some really cool work with stable isotopes. We got him out on a whale shark trip in May, and he was the first in the water, the keenest of the bunch. You know, you're a couple kilometers offshore, you're jumping into 60 meter water, not for the faint of heart. 
Brendan. Uh, Brendan was awesome. So uh, welcome to the stage, Brendan. Um, hello everyone, my name is Brendan, and for my honors thesis, mine was um, mine was discussing the parasitic copepod Pandorus rhachidonicus as a biochemical tracer of foraging patterns and dietary shifts by all sharks. <laughs> so, so as you know, the whale shark is the largest filter feeding fish in the world and is currently endangered under the IUCF red list. Um, Whale sharks form coastal aggregations across across most of the mid latitude waters where they're distributed uh, to efficiently feed and grow. So while at these aggregation sites, whale sharks can feed on a wide range of prey species, including krill, copepods, crab, and fish larvae, and sometimes like small fish. Um, but most of what we know about whale shark diet comes from us physically observing whale shark feeding in the water. So in this case, most of our understanding about diet comes from us physically observing in the water in coastal regions, in coastal shallow water regions. But as Megan has pointed out, whale sharks can feed at depth and move offshore into hundreds of thousands of short feet. So therefore, we only see a small portion of what and where whale sharks eat. So in this case, to overcome these challenges and get a better idea of what whale sharks eat when we can't see them, we can apply biochemical analysis such as stabilized turbulence. In this case, nitrogen shown on the y-axis there can be able to use to trace the trophic position of whale sharks in the food chain, while carbon can show different foraging habitats. And by combining these two, we can get an idea of what and where whale sharks eat. So in order to actually apply stable isotope analysis to whale sharks, we have to collect tissue samples. Most commonly, skin samples are the, the most common way that we can collect tissues for whale shark stable isotope analysis. But my research was focusing on whether or not we could use a different approach. In this case, my thesis, In, so my thesis uh, was focusing on whether or not we could use parasites in lieu of whale shark skin tissue samples uh, for stable isotope analysis. In doing so, we could reduce the need to biopsy whale, shark, uh, whale sharks and therefore reduce our impact on whale shark welfare. So to do this, um, I collected paired skin and whale shark samples from 72 whale sharks uh, between 2016 and 2022, um, with all those samples collected by the Ames field trips then, um, and found that parasites are pretty good indicators of the whale shark trophic position. So on the x-axis there, you can see parasite um, nitrogen and trophic position, and you can see that that's a pretty good correlation between parasite and whale shark host trophic position, indicating that parasites could be a pretty good indicator of whale shark trophic position. On the other hand, my research found that parasites were slightly poorer at predicting whale shark foraging habitats, and that could be um, likely a result of attachment of these parasites to their whale shark hosts and um, the differences in their timing there and could also be a result of differences in the timeframes between whale shark skin and parasite tissue samples. So in conclusion, my research showed basically that parasites were pretty good at identifying whale shark trophic position, but were limited in showing uh, whale shark foraging habitats. So because parasites couldn't be used as a fully perfect replica for whale shark skin. We can't throw out our biopsy spears yet, so we still have to biopsy and collect whale shark biopsy skin samples. Questions for Brendan? Yeah. So how did you, when you had the um, parasites, how did you extract what you needed to? Because obviously some of it is I assume parasite tissue. How were you able to 
differentiate and also extract just the interest, the one that you were interested about, which is the whale shark part of it, I guess. So for like I'm no, no 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 it's okay I'm like so they're obviously feeding on something that the whale sharks and then the whale sharks are feeding on whatever that is but how did how did you isolate just the whale shark part of that so um these parasites are hematological parasites so they feed most likely on their blood and we think that um, these parasites just feed on a single whale shark host across their entire lifetime so all their nutrition is basically from their whale shark hosts so in this case, changes in the trophic position or the foraging habitats we thought would, would um, be reflected in the parasites because they would shift alongside them. Um, so in that case, we we saw and we thought that we saw that that would be pretty good indicators of um, whale shark tissues. So they're not necessarily looking directly at the chemicals of whale sharks, but more just as an indirect proxy of whale sharks instead. Yeah. If you were sort of like speculating that you'd see the same thing, do you have any sort of ideas or theories to perhaps why you didn't? Yes, yeah, so um, there, there's, in, in, in the terms of the foraging habitats, um, I go into a lot of discussion about this in my thesis and I didn't have time for it here, but, but basically, um, when parasites attach to their hosts, they likely reflect the carbon source of their hosts when they attach to it. So whale shark skin kind of, it reflects a long period of time in whale shark feeding, so up to two or three years. So, and par these parasites may live for just a couple of months. So the differences in the time frames and the carbon um, isotopes may reflect different foraging habitats across different time frames. And and in the poor correlation, we kind of see that in the sense that whale sharks are feeding at different places at different times. And that's kind of also what Megan saw as well. So, yeah. It'd be cool if you could get some parasites from I know. your site from I the know. Bay. We've talked about this. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, we, we have discussed this like, well, could we get the parasites out? And everyone's just like, you can't take anything out of Indonesia. So, but I, that's why I was asking, I was like, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Brandy. So to bring us to a close now, we're going to hear from Sharon, who's joining us online. Hey, Sharon. She's um, recently joined us uh, working on her master's project um, on eDNA reefs, um, making use of some really cool samples that were collected on the um, Schmidt's Oceans Institute RB Falcor uh, last year, I believe. Over to you, Sharon. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Sharon. I'm a UWA Masters of Biology student, and I've just started working on my thesis in collaboration with Ames. Uh, and the topic that I'll be exploring is uh, exploring mesophotic coral reef communities with eDNA metabarcoding. So a bit of background context, uh, mesophotic coral ecosystems are light dependent coral reefs found at depths between 30 and 150 metres. And the dominant groups in this mesophotic zone are typically coral, sponges and algal species. And um, there's some example photos at the bottom there from the um, Schmidt expedition um, that I'll be talking about. Um, and these reef systems are found all over the world. However, very little is known or understood about them uh, as they are at depths beyond scuba. And so typically you need quite, uh, I guess, specialised and ex expensive equipment to access them. Um, I know that there's been some presentations on eDNA already, but again, I'll just go into this. Um, obviously, as species interact with their environment, they shed DNA in the form of you know, urine, feces, blood, or cellular material, such as skin cells. And then this DNA can be sampled from the environment in the form of water, soil, or air samples. So in the case of the eDNA samples with water, um, they're filtered through a filter paper to collect the trace DNA. Uh, which we can then extract back out for analysis to identify which species were present in the environment at that time. 
So regarding uh, my thesis project, I'm quite lucky in the sense that uh, Ames sort of did all the hard sampling work for me. Um, so back in 2021, Ames conducted a three week expedition at Ashmore Reef Marine Park on board the Schmidt Oceans Institute RV Falcor, which was a really exciting expedition. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but I'm just pointing to uh, Ashmore Reef. It's approximately about 400 kilometres off the coast of Australia. And it's a really exciting reef system because it's incredibly biodiverse and it's believed to be, I think, one of the most biodiverse um, for sclerotinian corals specifically of any reef system in WA. So a really exciting place to look at. Uh, so using an ROV or a remotely operated vehicle um, aboard the vessel, um, Ames were able to explore uh, seven locations um, and then they sampled eDNA from six of those locations. And so what you're seeing here is um, these general locations. And then within that, they took, um, they had three sample sites at 50, 150, sorry, 50, 100 and 150 metre depths. And then there were three samples taken at each of those depths at each of those locations. So we've got 54 uh, samples in total. And then along with that, um, you know, making use of the ROV, uh, they took some really great high quality image, um, video footage uh, along, I think they were 20 metre long transects. And so this is an example of uh, one of the videos uh, stills from 50 metres. And typically in environments like this, where you're accessing them only with an ROV, uh, you would do a bio biodiversity or an, a survey based on the imagery. And so there's different methods um, that different companies use to standardise this. Um, but for example, with Ames, I believe they use a, a still method. So with a, a video, they'll take, a, they'll generate a still image every couple of metres and then generate, I think it's 20 equidistant points um, and then analyse what species are in each of those points um, by an ecologist. And so that's a very sort of typical um, surveying method. And so it's going to be really interesting with these eDNA samples to see how that compares to the standard sort of traditional methods of surveying. So regarding the eDNA processing methods, uh, as sort of four stages, um, the first being DNA extraction, which I've already completed with the help of Lawrence in the lab, which was great. Uh, and that's the process of releasing the DNA back from the filter paper for analysis. Uh, we then go on to um, so PCR with gel electrophoresis, which we're targeting specific groups for amplification. So we're specifically wanting to look at uh, fish, sponges and cnidaria or corals. And so we've selected primers um, to target those specific groups. Uh, then there's library preparation and sequencing. So um, this is a step to ensure that the DNA concentrations are all equal for when they're blended together uh, to be sent off for se sequencing on the Illumina platform. And then the bioinformatics or data tidy up and, and statistical analysis, which is um, a lot of trimming um, all of the excess, um, I guess, reads that have been attached by the Illumina platform and the primers. And then we get onto the fun part, which is the statistical analysis and to really essentially see what we've picked up in our results. So some of the questions that we'll be looking at to answer is uh, essentially how effective is eDNA in detecting different taxa within these deeper environments. Uh, it's a relatively new and very understudied uh, area of science um, using eDNA at greater depths. Um, so it's going to be really exciting to see how that compares to the ROV sort of survey methods. What species can we identify that we can't identify in the ROV imagery um, and possible other questions that may arise. Um, we want to see whether the eDNA results show variation within the environment at varying depths. Um, and then also it's also uh, great information to understand which of the primers detect the most taxa uh, in this deeper system, uh, because that will then help future research in those deeper areas as well. And hopefully in the future, we could potentially do some sort of a comparative analysis of how eDNA, or I guess the, the crossover of eDNA results from these deeper reef systems and whether there is I guess, a correlation with the shallow systems as well. That's something that I think in the future would be really great to look at. Uh, so any questions? Great talk, Sharon. Any questions for Sharon? I've got one. Yeah. Yeah. John, go ahead. Uh, hi, Sharon. Thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, I 
What I know that the, the I think it was Sebastian you used the ROV, um, big and expensive and specialised on board a ship. Is there any scope, or did what's your opinion on AUVs in that as a as a substitute or complementary type of uh, system to help you with your work? Ooh, so I wasn't involved in any of the field work, sadly. Um, I know. Yeah. Yeah, no, and so I'm. I admit I am unfamiliar with what the term AUV is. Oh, sorry, autonomous underwater vessel. Yeah, so okay. Yeah. So, so so they can go. You know, they they don't get controlled by humans, and they can go down. And Ames is sort of interested in that area itself. Um, but I'm thinking, have you had any experience, or have you had any thoughts on uh, where they may fit in helping you do some of your science? Uh, no, I haven't, and that's actually a really exciting thing to think about. Um, I guess from without it being remotely operated by people, I guess site selection is obviously a um, a big. I'm guessing a big oh, in certain environments a bit of a barrier, right? In understanding what the uh, I guess what the terrain is like, and I'm not sure if UAVs have got systems on board of them that they can navigate that and um, and detect that, um, but. No, I haven't. I haven't had to think about it, but that's something I'll definitely. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, you're right. That that's one of the things that they have done. But this is some years ago. I, I'm obviously, this type of technology just moves really fast. But I do know that um, Schmidt did use several years ago the AUVs just to find, the, as you said, the site selection, and then they lump themselves on top of it and drop the uh, yeah, the R okay. ROV down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. I'll definitely be reading into that. For sure, and have a think about that. Maybe we get the uh, tech team to uh, work with you or something. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, will be right. picking people's brains. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any questions in the room for Sharon? Great talk, Sharon. Thanks very much for time. Uh, she Sharon also works full time, so she's taking on her project as a part time student. So thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. So that's us for today. Thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you to our online community. Um, Julian, I saw your face. We miss you. Um, <laughs> thanks for tuning in. Karen, thank you very much. Uh, to the Oceans Institute and IMROC staff, Josh, Vivian, thank you. Luis, thank you very much for helping organize today as well. Uh, great, see you next year. Thanks. <laughs>